Hi, everyone. This is And Just Like That, The Writer's Room, the official companion podcast from HBO Max and Pineapple Street Studios. I'm Michael Patrick King, executive producer, writer, and director of And Just Like That. And here with me, as always, we have executive producer and writer Julie Rottenberg. Hello. Hello. And executive producer <laughs> and writer Elisa Zaritsky. Hi. And joining this week's Writer Room discussion, we have the always delightful Samantha Irby. Welcome back, Samantha. Thank you for having me. Guess what? This is the joy of my life. <laughs> well, you're yes, the joy. You're of, you know what's the joy of my life? <laughs> we Hugging met you, you for the first time, not over Zoom, it at the party premiere. Mind it was blind. everything I wanted and more. I know. It made me sad that we weren't all in a room together writing the show. No, and all those lunches we could have had together at I least know, and drinks so after true. work. Well, also mm-hmm. the crazy thing was we met you for the first time right as we were setting foot on the red carpet for the premiere, which could not be a, a more <laughs> insane and awkward situation. So suddenly we're posing for pictures with Samantha and all we wanted to do was just hug Can and I just say, you. so I did not know we were going to get our pictures <laughs> taken. Yeah, oh that my was God. shocking. We were just going to like, because I was like, who cares about like, writers? writers. writers. Well, right. I was like, who cares about us? We're just going to talk to people. And then they told us that we had to have our picture taken. And I was like, I turned to Retina and I was like, wait, wait, <laughs> by who? <laughs> she pointed. By everyone. <laughs> yeah, she pointed to all the cameras and I, that's when I was like, oh, like my heart fell out of my butt. I was not prepared <laughs> for that part. Yeah, she that says she's talking. not prepared, but yet yes, she shows she up in amazing. a very chic black running suit, bringing wow. it. Some part of her, subconsciously, some part of her was aware that yeah, she had yeah. to look she good. No, ready I wanted to look up. good for you. <laughs> As Gloria said, <laughs> mission accomplished. Can I say that as a newbie to this, I've worked in TV before and I have written books, but I have never worked on anything with this sort of cultural impact. And at the risk of like sounding like a baby, um, it's a little bit like walking around as an open wound. Yes. Yes. When a hundred percent, it's like I'm listening to like the same podcast I always listen to, but now all of a sudden they're talking about this thing that really? I worked on, and it's like a shock, right? I'm like, oh, I did not expect that you would talk about this and that you would have opinions. Um, so I have spent the last week unfollowing and unsubscribing. <laughs> I, I, you know, I from a lot of shit because. They hurt my feelings. If you've been unfollowing people now, <laughs> wait until episode oh. five, which I am, first of all, I embrace it. I, I have come so long. I'm like a dinosaur in show business. <laughs> I am now at the point where I'm like, do you know how hard it is to get anyone to have a water cooler moment when no one's shit. even at an office and water coolers are not allowed? <laughs> and all of a sudden, it's like in the news for days. And that is thrilling because people are paying attention. You know, they're, they're, they're having an aggressive relationship or they're having a love affair. It's mm-hmm. a split. And that's, mm-hmm. what more can you ask? Right. But I'm telling you right now, we're getting about to get into some deep public opinion waters. Yes. With episode five, Tragically Hip, Crafted and written by Samantha Irby. Ooh. I am going to get off the internet until the end of January. No, you, you can get off the internet or you can get some armor. Yeah. Because yes, both existences that. are necessary if you're going to keep going forward. Mm-hmm. Now, this no, episode. That is true. This is the first script that was handed to me by Samantha. And I want to tell you that a typical television script is 40 pages. <laughs> Samantha (laughs) shamefully handed me 63 pages, and I loved every minute of it. Because that's but don't me. Don't try this at home, guys. Yeah. If you're right writing a, a script, hour. no, do Only try it. Only Samantha no, Irby nope, can I disagree. get away with that shit. Nope, I Correct. disagree. Mm, if it's okay. 63 good pages, when I started working 
uh, back in the prehistoric area on Murphy Brown, <laughs> my first script that I handed Diane English was 72 pages. But you're For Michael Patrick hour. King. Yeah, but that's how you become a <laughs> okay. good writer. Okay. By looking directly at the story <laughs> as it exists. And what I loved about Samantha's angle, all right, the episode is basically starting with Carrie has a hip problem. But I want to rally around. When Samantha wrote the scene where Carrie goes to the hospital, not only were Carrie and Miranda in the scene, but in her mind, she looked around and said, who else is in this scene? Who's look, who, who, who else would talk? And that's to me like an accordion. It just mm-hmm. opens up. And all of a sudden, my favorite line that shows you as an enormously skilled writer is you knew reality was when you go to the hospital, you have to stand and fill out boring, boring forms, <laughs> admission forms, and you knew you as a bitch viewer didn't <laughs> want to see Carrie go through that. <laughs> and you created this joke, which is so perfectly crafted because not only is it funny, it takes away a lot of time that you don't have to stand and watch, is I filled out the forms online in an extremely productive panic attack. And that line to me is TV (laughs) writing in its finest. (laughs) Grazie. Thank you. Mm -hmm. So let's just recap what the episode is actually about. We wanted an episode that somehow became about Carrie having an experience that had nothing to do with death. And so Kelly in the writing room had this weird congenital birth hip thing, which was a a, a weird malfunction in her hip, and she had this surgery. She thought it was a back problem. She thought it was... Yeah, she thought it was everything that Carrie thinks it is. But in reality, it was just a pain. And if you notice, it's alluded to in the second episode where she says, sometimes my back big has to rub it. So when we realized, oh, Carrie can have surgery... And it can be something that her (laughs) friends rally around her. And it's realistic because it happened to fabulous Kelly. We got to give her hip problem. So we got the best of all possible worlds. We got to make the old lady jokes that everybody at home is thinking. Pause for reaction. (laughs) And then we got to say, no, fuck you. She's not old in this episode. But the really rallying call was how you need your friends when you're in a situation where you're vulnerable and infirmed and how the episode proves that there's still a hole where Mr. Big isn't because friends have their own lives. So that was the episode. And we also used it to be the fact that Carrie is home alone and sedated gave us the very bizarre abstract window to bring the Carrie storyline and the Miranda storyline together in what I think is the most complicated scene I've ever tried to navigate, which is carry asleep on half the amount of pain medication, which allows her to wake up in the middle <laughs> while Miranda's being fingered by Che. Which, like... Even take Carrie out of it. Miranda is married. (laughs) It's like it's already such crossing such a threshold and then add to it in her best friend's apartment where she's sleeping. That fingering scene is written explicitly exactly what you see. (laughs) <laughs> exactly. Samantha was all in. And what is oh, yeah. added is the magnificent sort of, I'm going to call it, uh, I've, since I've referenced dinosaurs, Miranda's paleolithic orgasm. This like giant noise coming out of her, which was Cynthia's first instinct. And Gillian Robespierre, who is the director, was like, what's happening? Should it be smaller? And I was like, I think that's Cynthia's instinct. And what I started to like about it was that it was the birth of something. Mm -hmm. It felt like labor pains Mm -hmm. and birth rather than titillating. Like, And there are versions, literally, there are versions where she goes, "Eh, eh, eh, eh." (laughs) and I was like, how are we going to jumpstart this into comedy? Because Cynthia will do whatever you ask. And Cynthia and Sada were like, oh, my God, here we go. But, Mm -hmm. of course, that was my biggest request for Samantha. 
you must be here when they're fingering. Yes, Who's Samantha. going to get in there? What happened to that promise? We're, we're bringing us well, back. Well, because I'm bringing us back another to another job. Yeah, like, you'll be on set that day. <laughs> I had another job, but here's the thing. It's good that I wasn't there because I don't know that I could have handled it. I would have mm. soiled myself. <laughs> Because it's so hot. The- I mean, I don't know if anyone did any behind the scenes lobbying. I did not. So when this episode was assigned to me, I was like, oh man, I'm really going to write a horny sex scene for these two. I could like see it in my, it was perfect. Um, But you know what like surprised and delighted me was... Cynthia, in the fight with Carrie, mm. or I i mean, it, it feels less like a fight than a— Oh, no, oh. it's a fight. When I think it's a declaration. She, at first, before she gets really upset, the way she—how you can tell that something has shifted in her, right? She's, like, giggly, and, like, Miranda's not a silly person Mm -hmm. i think in that moment you get a brief glimpse of like she's so good at switching from this sort of like euphoria and then coming back down to earth like that was really astonishing to me like i know she's a good actress but i was like i re i felt all those emotions even as they were changing Mm mm-hmm Yeah, it was a phenomenal day on the set when we did that because not only was Cynthia doing that, but aside from the fingering, then you have Sarah Jessica literally sliding out of a bed, finding that knife edge between tragic and comic Mm -hmm. to the point where, I mean, there's a moment where Sarah Jessica lands the whole thing when she blows the straw out of her mouth that tells the audience, it's okay, you can laugh, it's crazy. (laughs) But the fact that she is so realistic, when I looked at it, I was like, wow, this is the miracle worker, only she's Annie Sullivan and Helen Keller. (laughs) This performance is... Only you would make that. Well, but it's because she's doing both parts Parts, in that moment. She's the the strong one and the Mm out-of-control one. Mm -hmm. And Mm -hmm. I was just like, this is both of the scenes, both of the two pieces that Mm -hmm. go together. They're both all in. The only way someone can be when they're committed to the story and the characters. And then when Mm. Carrie calls her on her shit, just sitting there so strong, oh my God. And what was so arresting for me was Miranda, she's on the toilet, she shuts the door. When she comes out, that fake armor she put up, was mm-hmm. so chillingly real, and it said so much about the fact that she wasn't being her mm-hmm. true self with Carrie. She went back to playing this role, and then the minute Carrie calls her on it, how it breaks. Like, mm-hmm. she just shatters you with her, like, okay, we're going to be honest now. Mm-hmm. You want me to be honest? Like, that's right. what it felt like to me. And how yeah. surprising that, and I, I think, real also that these two friends who we have always assumed and seen share everything with each other. What a revelatory moment that even Miranda's been holding on to this secret of her own unhappiness from her best friend in the world. Mm -hmm. I think, sadly, that's also what we do sometimes with the scariest facts of a, of what we're going through. You know, when you come out, it's a moment where the internal engine of your truth upstages your fear that society slash your friends and family will not accept you anymore. So the idea that the profound physical yearning to some abstract thing that Miranda's feeling some connection to this powerful being, which is sort of awakening something in her, that she stops thinking about 
the other parts of the world. And that means Carrie's in the next room. She doesn't give it a thought. Of course, it helps because we're writers and we gave her a lot of tequila and pot Mm -hmm. to (laughs) open that door. But the reality is that's stronger than her fear of somebody discovering it. It's bigger. And that's what's exciting. And I've always, always loved to carry Miranda showdown. Mm-hmm. I mean, Me too. the episode splat from the series when they're talking about Petrovsky and you go to Paris, that bald, scalded, unadorned mm-hmm. emotion that they do. Yeah. Um, does anyone have any feelings? Because I have big feelings about what the audience is going to feel about Miranda and Steve. Because I think... of the couples watching this are Miranda and Steve. (laughs) And ouch. And I love that part of (laughs) my relationship. And I think of that, of the 90% of They identify. Let's just say they identify. They identify. That is what most marriages are to one degree or another. But I maintain that of the 90% of the couples watching— and identifying and saying, yeah, I have a ritual with my spouse every night when we watch television and kick up our heels. I think there's also a segment of that 90% who will who are restless, especially after or rather during the pandemic <laughs> that we're still that we're still struggling with. And and it's not just my my personal opinion. I mean, there have been articles written about the divorces that have come Mm -hmm. out of this time. I think there's—it's been a come to Jesus, I think, for couples. Um, Can—is this the rest of my life? Is this what I choose? Is this person enough? I wonder, though— I agree. You're probably right, Michael. 90% of marriages, people will identify with that. The routine. The routine. Not the lack of sex. Not yeah, that. Sure. Yes. Just the, the calmness comfort, of maybe it. Maybe the comfort yes. and security. The last- Hello, I am the dessert ritual queen. I'm here for it. <laughs> but I do wonder when they see Miranda doing that, if they will go to their very judgmental heads, which mm-hmm. we're also seeing. Yes. And it's easier because Steve is a good man and he is a good father and he is a good husband in many ways, I'm going to venture to say. A good partner. And, and how yeah. dare she betray him like that. But I wonder how many people will own that they might aspire to and if they own stray it, from their marriages. If they identify with that need to break out, do they judge it? Do they like right. that feeling? Right. Do they like the escape fantasy of yeah. it? Or do they resist it and rage against it? I also think that when we were filming it and I saw Cynthia crack open emotionally as Miranda when she says she can barely even say the words, I'm not happy. Mm-hmm. I actually turned to, I think, you two, and I said, she just gave us permission for the storyline mm-hmm. because someone not being happy yeah. is important. Doesn't mean anyone else is to blame. It means they're not happy. I mean, maybe the way she's going about it, Miranda, I mean, she's going about it isn't um, the best way. You know, I'm mm-hmm. sure people would like her to tidily divorce mm-hmm. Steve and split their assets before banging someone new. But there are going to be people who are like, okay, she's doing a complete overhaul of her life and I get it. And I support that. And it's super brave to do that, especially when you're already settled, right? Like you're 55, you have a good job, you have enough money. Um, It's really brave to be like, I want to do something else. I want to be of service. And also, I don't want to eat ice cream with my husband anymore. I want to get fingered by a podcast host. I mean, that's on my bucket list. I mean, the other thing... Fingered by a podcast host. Let me just say that the other great thing that the hip surgery gave us was the idea of an uh, unfocused carry because of prescription drugs. So we got to see looser carry, which introduced another sort of interesting story point for us, which is she mentions a classic episode where... Uh, Samantha from season one, I think, or season 
season one, one, one or two, where Samantha, her, her diaphragm is stuck, and Samantha says— Jones, not Irby. Samantha, Samantha <laughs> Jones. <laughs> Although Samantha Irby would go Do get that, that diaphragm That's true. Out. She's, and right. Carrie comes— all, I know it was early in the series because they were hanging out at her apartment, all four of them, yes. with nothing to do, which was— there was no restaurant, Perfect. there was no club. Oh so God. they're hanging out there, and Carrie's going on a date, but she tried a diaphragm, and it was stuck. She couldn't get it out. She decided she didn't want it. So Samantha says, turn around and go in. And she looks at the, as Carrie leaves, she looks at the other two and says, and I just had my nails done. So (laughs) that episode was very edgy for that time that a friend would pull somebody else's diaphragm out. So when I think of Samantha and friendship, I think of that. And the fact that Carrie, we deliberately had Carrie reveal that because she's high on something and it's just something she wouldn't reveal if she was in her right mind, which makes her journey on the podcast blissful to Bobby Lee and uh, Sada Ramirez's characters because they're like, she's finally given it up. And then you see that look on Charlotte's face like, oh, God, she just mentioned Samantha. And the whole thing's in there because we love the idea of keeping Samantha alive. Mm-hmm. And how do we bring Samantha in, which is Charlotte's perfectly socially over-concerned about someone oversharing. So we got Carrie to reach out to Samantha. And it feels exciting because Samantha responds in a true Samantha text, I'm glad your vagina is getting airtime. <laughs> and for that minute, Samantha Jones is in the show, in the script that Samantha Irby wrote. <laughs> I do love to... Because when friendships end, sometimes it's like scorched earth. You never Mm -hmm. talk again. But there is, I mean, Carrie's having like parallel mourning experiences. Mm -hmm. And it's like being able, you know, when someone dies, it's like, okay, that's it, right? Like I can be sad. I can think about the good times. There's no danger of that person coming back you know, like you can (laughs) freeze them in your mind in like whatever way you want. But when your friendships end and the person is just like across what ocean separates, Mm. I'm too dumb to uh, know which ocean (laughs) she's across. But (laughs) it's like there's someone over there who like maybe I should talk to her. Maybe I should reach out. Maybe this will become a friendship again. And so it's, I think it's interesting because, like, you don't just put someone out of your mind. You know, I have friends I haven't talked to, or, like, we're we're not friends anymore. But if they called, I'd take the call. The ending of a friendship is so, like, tricky and weird. And I, I love seeing Carrie, like, navigate that. I agree. And I also love that in this day and age, like, this moment we're in— texting exists as this mm-hmm. little this little arrow you can point at someone because you know 15 years ago a falling out with a friend it's much harder to just touch a you know touch base a tiny bit and say thinking of you or happy birthday mm-hmm. uh you you're not picking up the phone you're not writing out a card and so i i personally uh appreciate that that's how Sure. That's how they stay even mm-hmm. a tiny bit in each other's a life. Safe and they bit. could do this yeah. dance forever. They could yeah. do the, hey, happy birthday for, for years. 10 years, and it wouldn't fix the friendship, mm-hmm. but also it's not dead and buried. Mm-hmm. But it's Sarah a, Jessica is playing a- it too, which I always loved. It, it's just another breakup. Mm-hmm. And when she's holding that phone before she texts Samantha, it might as well be her holding the black rotary phone before she decides whether she's going to call big and hang up. Mm -hmm. Or when she was going online, when no one was going online and she sends Aiden an email. The idea of, should I let it alone Mm -hmm. or should I risk healing something is, it's a breakup. It's another Mm -hmm. breakup and it's just another uh, avenue of exploring who she is now post big and post her everyday connection to Samantha. We always try to weave stories together. When we did Sex and the City, there was always four storylines. Each of the ladies had a story, and it was always like this braid that we kept weaving. Okay, this is the sex story. This is the personal story. This is the 
Comedy, the comedy funny. Runner. Comedy funny, and this is the friend story. So there's still that DNA in this show. And the the second strand that we tried to weave through episode five is Charlotte and Rose. So Charlotte has this incredibly awkward moment on the Zoom with the mom friends where someone refers to Rock being so great in the school play. And Charlotte's like, wait, did I miss something? Is there a new kid? And you see all those moms' faces just freeze in terror. And then you get to do the joke, did everybody just freeze? Everybody just which is freeze. what has happened constantly <laughs> on Zoom on when Zoom. somebody's so stunned they don't move. Um, and this is how she and Harry discover, and we decided a, a, a new interesting way to do it would be to steal right from Sam's uh, life story. Do you want to tell your story? Yeah, we, so I have a wife and she has kids and her youngest sent randomly, like we were watching TV, sent a TikTok that was like, hey, I'm a lesbian. <laughs> and <laughs> no explanation, no context. And I was like, I mean, the first thing I thought was like, is th- like, is this real? Because that's what you think, you know, like, yeah. is right. th- everything is seems this like a, a joke. Real, is this right. a real thing? Uh, <laughs> and then, yes, it was real. And I was like, oh man. I mean, adjusting to living with kids is like a whole thing that I don't know how well I'm doing at that. But adjusting to the way they communicate is a whole. I mean, I just was like, okay, great. It's so refreshing. We could just move forward in this new reality. And immediately when we started talking about this in the room, I was like, I have an idea for how uh, we should find out about Rock. It also, there's so much of like, my friends knew this two months ago. Mm -hmm. And you're like, I'm just now getting around to telling you. And on the one hand, it's like, I'm glad your friends, like these kids are so progressive. They accept everything. You just, there's never a problem. It's just like, okay, these are my pronouns. I told my friends they're using them. Um, But on the other hand, it's like, oh man, as the adult, I'm not the most important person to tell. Right. And you didn't have to like sit down and have a very special conversation with me. It's very cool, but also disconcerting at the same time. It's very current yes. in terms of the way information is out. And I also think mm-hmm. the fact that Rock did it on a TikTok is how smart Rock is. It mm-hmm. subliminally comes in the side, mm-hmm. didn't want to have the conversation. And when you mm-hmm. look at Lily... When Charlotte says, when in the discovery moment, did you knew about this and you didn't say anything? Lily just, whew, sibling just doesn't get involved. Mm-hmm. She just looks away. I also yeah. love personally that the helicopter mom, who we know Charlotte to be, <laughs> has just missed this. Uh, we could have gone the other way where... Charlotte, who has definitely told both of her kids, I will be looking at your social media, so don't <laughs> think it's private. But she she actually is, you know, she dropped a ball, and I, that's well, ten, ten, fun. T- and our, ju- <laughs> our justification is, is what Samantha said. Well, you put about 10 TikToks yes. up a day yes. I'm behind. Yeah. Yes. Oh, yeah. I'm not sure. I can't keep up with anything these kids do. I'm like, I... No, I didn't look at my phone for 10 minutes, and now the entire world has changed. Right. Great. Yeah, that's right. <laughs> um, I think this is, a, this is a moment to really talk about the fact that um, our scripts and us as writers have always checked in with GLAAD, um, the LGBTQ plus advisory board, mm-hmm. media board. And one of the interesting things that we've sort of been in this dance with them about is how this can be presented so that it isn't able to be picked up by any one side to be used Mm -hmm. as proof that the other side is right in the consciousness. So one of the things that they were very interested in was how the teachers were going to be presented Mm -hmm. because you would immediately go to the joke teachers who are Either overly abusive or or overly overly woke or 
dismissive or a cartoon. Mm -hmm. And so the two actors that we hired for the parent-teacher conference are as legitimate and as grounded and as caring as possible because Mm -hmm. they're ahead in their world of where Harry and Charlotte are. So the fun thing about the story, of course, is Harry. Mm -hmm. And Mm -hmm. opening up Harry Mm -hmm. and the debate about whether he can have any opinion. Mm -hmm. And we wrestled with walking the line between um, showing what's real, because I felt as the parent of a kid who decided they were non-binary at a pretty young age, I I wanted to show the real struggle and journey that parents can go through. I do think this expectation that somehow we all just will wake up one day knowing all the right words is unrealistic. And I do think it is necessary to show what it's like to try even when you mess up with the trying. And I think the same thing for Harry and Charlotte. I really loved, like, watching it, I really loved that he he's not not accepting, but he's also like, well, this is a parental, you know, like, the school has made a decision regarding my child that I don't know anything about. That's normal. I think that's like a natural response to finding out like something is different with your kid and no one told you. I would also be like, yo, I'm cool with it, but uh, like, give me a call. Mm-hmm. Let Like, clue me in. <laughs> I don't want to be out of the loop with my own kid, but there's another adult who knows. And I think that like Harry... Harry and Charlotte in that scene are so good at, like, balancing between, like, yes, we'll do whatever, but also, what does this mean? Mm -hmm. And how do I do this? And I think the culture is so quick to be like, oh, you're not on board with that yet? What the fuck is wrong with you, you Mm -hmm. oppressor? And it's like, listen— I just am still trying to do the reading. I don't right. know like how you have it uploaded into your brain already, but it's going to take me a minute and I think I think it is worth showing a realistic depiction of someone who's like, "Great, I'll do whatever you want. I just I got to learn yeah, how to do yeah, it." I don't and understand I think this. that this is a an incredible journey to watch them go on. And you know, every now and then you're in the writing room and you're you're writing and we all check in with each other and like, that's it. Yeah, that's the feeling. That scene in the hallway is very important for a lot of reasons and I knew it was important. So then you get in the editing room and you're like, okay, well, they're walking down the hall. What is the sound that is under this? Mm-hmm. It needs support. And I looked at Elisa, because somebody had dropped in a piece of music. In this process, there's a lot of music supervisors say, what about this? And it was just melodramatic. It was just a choice, but it wasn't final. It was just, it made it sad. And I said to Elisa, what do your kids listen to? What are they singing in school? And she said, David Bowie. (laughs) And I went on Google and I said, David Bowie, children's class. And ground control to Major Tom came up. And I was just like, oh! I mean, oh guys, my God! They really are sitting in a tin can. I mean, it's that's true. literally <laughs> the, the, that. That is the recording of those kids that I googled in a classroom singing that, and it brought me emotionally as somebody who doesn't have children and doesn't have to sit across from parents. This larger, mystical, magical thought that kids are so advanced now that they're singing David Bowie and and then it, that ooh under what Charlotte's mm-hmm. not saying. I mean, it's just a little piece of heaven, but once again, mm-hmm. it comes right out of somebody's personal experience. Elisa, what are your what are they singing? <laughs> David Bowie. <laughs> well, and also the toggling that you do in a marriage when you're going through whatever you're going through with a kid is like only one person at a time (laughs) often can be the one like Harry's having a hard time in that moment so Charlotte is just there for him and is in a way the rock and then later you see her with Carrie 
that was another scene we wrestled with a lot um, because I really wanted Charlotte to say all the scary, ugly things she was feeling that she felt safest with Carrie to say that maybe she couldn't even say to Harry and definitely not with the teachers. I wanted Charlotte to let herself be really in a state of pain and to have Carrie be the one who throws her that I life mean, raft of a rose by any mm-hmm. other name. The interesting thing about a rose by any other name would smell as sweet was batted around. At one point, Harry was the hero and yes. said it to Charlotte. And they were like, no. <laughs> and then it was Charlotte said it to Harry. <laughs> right, and we're like, right. okay, that's <laughs> right. further along. That's and true. then we realized right back to the DNA of the series, the real significant relationship is your friends. So that we have Carrie, of course, who's a writer, who could actually bring that out of her own consciousness. And who has the perspective that neither Charlotte or Harry would have. They're so mm-hmm. close to it. Mm-hmm. That's their kid. And this happens with kids who aren't non-binary. You discover you have no control over your kid. They'll pick a different nickname. They'll pick a different, you yeah, know. And, and you see in that scene that Carrie's moved along. She's off the painkillers. She's on to crutches. <laughs> and interesting, the painkillers gave us so much fun. But mm-hmm. one of the things that, like, Sarah Jessica surprised us with was the pink hat for the podcast. Because she's like, <laughs> oh, I'm wearing this. And we're like, what? You're wearing a pink hat? And then it became all about the pink hat. And then we even went further that she puts it on the lampshade. And then everybody knows if you put something on the lampshade, it bursts into flames. And we have Charlotte taking care of her as a mother. But the pink hat was a bonus. And the other great bonus that Samantha wrote that was insistent on was Hot Fellas Van driving her home. Now, it used to be Stanford and Anthony. Mm -hmm. And then we lost Willie. So it became... Right, Anthony and Prince Carrie. Boner, which is, and we got to do, we got to do something that Mario does for us constantly on set, which is his impressions of divas. And there he is doing Betty Davis for Carrie, and she says, "As much as I die for his baby Jane Hudson." Now that is that is sophisticated, <laughs> gay, straight girl back and forth right there. But the idea of the pink hat gave us the drugs, gave us the pink hat, and the hot fellas van. Is just it just keeps getting. And I'll just say that every time you see a hot fellas anything on the show, it gave us the writers a lot of bread, free bread. And not only the writers, but everybody on the crew. Baguettes, Lots of delicious. Like I just had last yeah, night. Yeah, who made the bread? bread? Peanut butter and jelly. Because in props, you Sourdough. never know. There's always an excess, and I would see Julie leaving with <laughs> what looked like she was going home to a French village that hadn't eaten. <laughs> Anything. And I'd be she's Julie. She's Belle in Beauty and the Beast. Oh, she's Belle, but even Julie home. had more bread than Belle. That's for sure. <laughs> And just like that, we've reached the end of the podcast episode. Thanks, Elisa, Julie, and Sam for being here. We'll be back next week to unpack episode six. See you then. This is the official companion podcast for the HBO Max show and Just Like That. And it's a production of HBO Max and Pineapple Street Studios. Our executive producers are Barry Finkel, Gabrielle Lewis, Max Zielinski, and Jenna Weiss-Berman. Our senior producer on the show is Emmanuel Hapsis. Jonathan Shiflett is our producer, and Janelle Anderson is our associate producer. Our managing producer is Aaron Kelly. Josh Gwynn is our story editor, and our engineers are Davey Sumner and Elliot Adler. Production music is courtesy of HBO Max. You can listen to the next episode of And Just Like That, the Writer's Room podcast, after watching episode six of And Just Like That on HBO Max. And don't forget to subscribe for new conversations every week, wherever you get your podcasts.